Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel Elkanen. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been a penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Hope everyone's having a great day. Welcome to Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel, Joel L. Khan, and Dennis Dick with you this morning. I uh, got a lot to get to. Uh, we got a lot of offerings last night, guys. Like at le- I felt like five, six, seven at least stock offerings in the after-hour session. So we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about Fastly. Uh, that was sort of the headline on the morning at I'm, it was. The, I think the headline might already be over now, but uh, there was an outage. Uh, stock traded down, and uh, now it's coming back a little bit. But um, stock fastly. Uh, we'll talk the new stocks that are being pumped on social media today. Uh, two guests. Uh, first up at age 15, we have Paul Monica. He's a digital correspondent at CNN Business. And then at nine, I've got Brian Gu, the vice president and chairman of Xpong. Motors, ticker XPEV, uh, talking all about their latest model, the P5, uh, and more. So very excited for that. Uh, got a good show for you today. Everyone smash that like button. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, Joel, what's the word on the S&Ps this morning? How are we doing? Guys? Oh, wild ride this morning here. Uh, had a break around 6.30, 7 o'clock on that outage. Uh, got through yesterday's low just by a couple points and by the dip, uh, reign supreme here. We're up uh, six and three quarters handles at 42.32 and a quarter. Crude is down 62 cents at 68.61. Uh, gold still over, hovering over 1900. That's up 270 at 1901.50. Silver struggling with 28, down 13 cents at 27.88. And, uh, we talked about 35k, folks, and when you uh, bound, you head on a support, you hover there long enough, you get taken out. Bitcoin, that's down 2,600 bucks at 33,000 on the futures. Ethereum following suit today, that's down 200 and send, uh, 207 dollars at 2,534. Uh, good morning, Dennis, and. Uh, how you doing on this Tuesday morning on Wall Street? Mm, tired, tired. It's been a long night. I had about a hundred derogatory messages sent to me on Twitter last night because of my comments that there isn't naked shirting going on in AMC. It's fun, you know, like dealing with this stuff. Um, you know, anyways, is what it is. They're just gonna say, "Oh, I'm crying about it," but you know, I got people going like this. Sleep well in your cottage. You know, like this makes you just not want to do and talk any of this stuff. So it's very disappointing that people have to verbally and say derogatory things to you because you give an opinion. Like I'm just using logic. The AMC borrow, Karen Feinerman said it on CNBC last night. The AMC borrow is an easy borrow on the street. She said she could get it everywhere. I just tried multiple places. I can get it everywhere. Why would you? do something illegal when you can do it legally. So (laughs) you can literally borrow the stock. No problems at all. Legally for 0.6% or 1% or maybe 2% depending on your broker a year. But it's a whole theme that everybody's doing it illegally. So naked short just for fun. Why don't you just do it illegally just for fun? So anyways, that's all I'm going to say about AMC. Not going to talk about the stock again today because I don't need another thousand derogatory messages sent to me. Um, I and think the nice people get up early in the morning, Dennis. A lot of great. <laughs> like, lot I don't know because I'm looking I at say, the chat I do want to say a I'm lot of great chat here. sent to me too. I think some people saw. Uh, I retweeted a couple things that people were saying. There was a lot of great messages. Thank you so much for the nice messages that were sent to me. Some people said some really good stuff because I contemplated not even doing the show today just because I didn't want to come out here. But I'm doing it for those people who are, you know, the avid listeners who've been listening to us for years. There were so many nice things said about me as well. Um, just, you know, people sending me messages, you know, we thank you for the information. I wasn't even saying, like, the stock's going up or down. I was just giving the information that I don't believe there's any naked shorting going on at AMC because it's an easy borrow. People don't want to hear that. So you know, it's, you know, it's kind of funny because I, uh, I'm i not on Twitter as much. I don't look as much. And I'm looking at his messages, and I'm like, 
is it, is that mean? Is someone being mean to me? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> like, don't, don't, don't I don't even being know. Mean to me, Joel. It wasn't a question. It wasn't a question of whether oh, they're being mean. It was just flat out mean. A lot of mean stuff said. It was probably the uh, the most hurtful night I've ever had on social media. Um, people going out of their way to say really, really hurtful things. <laughs> so, anyways, it is what it is. I I don't even want to talk about AMC. Okay, let's go. Like I, said, I don't need another thousand Move messages. Though the problem is, it's driving stocks. Well, so the movers yep. today, if I go to my big filter, and we that's what we talk about on this show, is we talk about the movers. Yeah. If I go to the big movers today, it's all Reddit names. Clover right at the top, Reddit name. Mm-hmm. Wendy's. Wendy's is the new one today. It's Reddit name. It's trading up 17% in the free market. They do market. have good burgers and fries. They do. They do. Kramer jumping on the bandwagon there, too. So you can tell if I'm not you know, into it here today. You can tell I'm pretty beat up from last night. So anyways... Let's try to talk stocks here. Where do you want to go? We'll let Mr. Biogen. Mr. Israel leave. Biogen. So. Let's, let's do Let's talk it. Biogen. Let's talk Biogen. All right. Let's talk Biogen. Uh, what, what, is, what is the pricing of this drug? $50,000, $56,000 a year, I think. Um, I they think just I, priced it this morning. I think I saw that. Wait. Let me confirm because I, I, I want to give you the, re, the exact number, not the wrong number. Uh, yeah. The pricing was this morning. They priced uh, – ba 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 ba. Uh, 50, yes, fifty-six thousand dollars a year is what uh, Biogen's now FDA-approved Alzheimer's drug will cost somebody. So, and they have the whole market to themselves. So, uh, I'm long Biogen. I remain long Biogen. I'm not selling Biogen. My average cost basis is forty-five dollars, which goes to show you know long-term holding does work if you can actually do it. I've had it in my portfolio for about ten years, probably now. Um, the big move. It was expected. You know, we knew it was going to be a big move. We knew if they got an approval, it was going to be a big move. I said it could get even as much as 200 points in approval. It was conditional approval, which was interesting. They've never really done that. They have to actually do another trial yet, and they can pull the approval if the next trial doesn't go well. So it was interesting that it was a conditional approval. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but I can just say um, you know, it's a big move for the stock. It was expected um, that it would have a big move if it got approved. I did not think it, it would get approved. It did. I'm happy about it. I'm long the stock. I don't know what to say about the price here, though. Like, it, it's tricky because, you know, this conditional approval thing, it's like, you know, going forward, okay, well, what does that mean? There's still going to be some people buying it up here thinking, okay, well, you can make a lot of money from this, but what if they pull it? So it's not just, you know, and it could be one of the largest selling, like, drugs, you know, and like I think it was Kramer was saying, it's one of the biggest drugs ever. If you know it actually does get full approval, which it, you know has a conditional approval right now, so great for Biogen shareholders. I don't know where the price goes from here, though. Really hard to predict. Uh, f- my first instinct is how how are the insurance companies doing? I mean, fifty six k. I mean, that's got a you know that's a pretty hefty bill, right? For the insurance companies to pick up, or am I am I stretching here on this? I, well, uh, someone's got to pay for it, right? Someone's got to pay for it. Uh, I just saw the rep, and I just you know my historical thinking mind, Dennis. I think we were doing the show live uh, back in fifteen when they announced that they were going into this, and it hit four eighty that day. I think four eighty eighteen. And then you can see what's happened over the years. I have no position in the stock and was not trained in stock, but holy moly, you get all of this back on one announcement. I mean, if you're buying, then you're buying. You think it's going to 500, but uh, 20 points within the all time high that was made six years ago. I just think mathematically, people were just rigging the register on it. Uh, I think it's going to come back down. I think it, you know, eventually really messed up my charts for now. Um, but I think it's eventually, will it ever fill the gap on the, you know, because there's really not a gap. That's really weird because it was traded and halted. So I guess just keep an eye on the close. Um, you know, if you're looking to, you know, trade this from a shorter long-term perspective, 90, uh, 95, 85 is high as close in a long time. This looks like four sellers. Like I'm getting out of 400 now. That's kind of what the pre-market chart looks to me. And then you could also look. I guess you do have a gap on the daily chart, but I think you're just going to leak slowly here. And you know, 
get down. I don't know where. I think it's a really hard one. You're struggling with yeah. the two, Joel. I can't. Yeah, I know. It, it, I yeah, you got a big gap here. It's on no news. Idea. It 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 maybe overshot a little bit off the hop because people were buying it. Like I thought it would be worth 200 points on a on a on an approval, but it goes conditional approval. So you know, it got the big pop where it's like a 170 up 170 180 points, but. It was a conditional approval. So, and then a lot of, you know, you know, they're saying, well, you know, Lily has a, uh, has a drug right now. Oh, they got pop too. Why, why don't, yeah. And they all did because like, if you're going to give conditional approvals all of a sudden, which is something the FDA t- historically hasn't done, nope. then a lot of these other companies may as well file as well. Well, so, it's already happening here. Uh, what's the ticker this morning is AVXL. Yeah. They have a PR. And so now they're all going to come out and saying, yeah, we're doing studies. We're doing trials too. Don't forget Why to- not? Right. Why not? Um, and I think Saba was another one, too, that kind of popped up. We on should it, bring right? Adam Pierstein back on because he was saying in his tweets, too, Joel, that this sets a dangerous precedent. That yeah. if you're going to start giving conditional approvals, maybe we'll reach out to Adam. We've had Adam Pierstein yeah. on. He, he does some great research. I mean, maybe one of the top, obviously, in, in the I, sector. I would say the top. I would say the yeah, top. I would say the top, too. I'll give him the top, you know, analyst in the sector. Let's bring Adam Fierstein on this week right. if we can do it and ask him it's some of these it. questions. I, 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 as soon as we get by, as soon as we got, I go to Adam Fierstein's feed to yeah. see what he has to say because he's the man in the sector. So let's bring on Adam, um, you know, this week, and we'll get his thoughts as well because we're struggling with the charges. Yeah, They're I mean, so full of news. Hard to predict. What does this mean for other companies if they're going to FDA is going to start handing out conditional approvals? It, it, it took the market by surprise. I mean, yeah, we were running up. And they were saying, yeah, we had the two day run up ahead of the event, but you know, stock still gapped up sixty percent on the news. I think it was surprised that you know it didn't end up getting even a conditional approval. So I'm happy as a Biogen shareholder. I'm happy about it, but I'm still skeptical that this still is going to get full approval. So we'll see what Adam says. Right, and it. And uh, Biogen got approval for a drug that uh, it like the approval. It, it, it doesn't say that the drug slows down cognitive decline. It says that it slows like this pro this one protein down that may slow decline. Right? It's like a technicality. But, Very interesting. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, Very convoluted. Yes, yes, a, a little bit. Uh, uh, Lele says Joel's looking 10 years younger. Was it because of the swim this morning? Maybe? I don't know. Joel, you're looking good today, says says Lele. Yeah, at time, um, 6 o'clock. Not, not too many people in the pool, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it all, they were all, all busy it. trading Fastly, Joel, at 6 o'clock. Yeah, I, I, got up, I got up for Fastly. Well, let, um, let's, do, let's do Fastly quick, and then we'll bring Paul yeah. on. Uh, so, yeah, Fastly came out and said uh, on their Twitter that there was a – uh, an outage this morning. Uh, they said the issue was fixed like an hour later, and it affected AWS. It affected a bunch of media. It affected Benzinga. Um, oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're back. It's on crazy off. how much it controls. You don't realize until it goes down. Like, I mean, I actually think this is bullish for the stock. I'm long fastly, so I'm talking my book to a certain extent here, but. It really lets you know how important Fastly is. I mean, a lot of sites went down. A lot of sites relying on this company. So um, it, it got just silly on the news. You can see in the 630 handle, we somebody just said, get me the hell out. And they sold this down to $47. Here's a stock that had a fantastic day yesterday. Breaking out. Growth is back in favor. We've been talking about the growth trade back in favor. Like I said, I am still long fastly, full disclosure. I plan on holding it through this, not planning on selling at least for the next little while. Um, I haven't sold any shares. I did buy some extra shares, though, um, this morning just for a scalp because when this thing went down to 47, then I'm trying. It swept. It like swept down to 47, so I had to have an order out there to get that initial print. But I'm like, man. 47 so then i'm trying 47 and a half it's trading above me a little bit i'm trying 47 70 47 80 trying to get up i finally got some stock in the low 48s and i was able to flip that scalp trade off literally 10 minutes later in the high 49s so um just you know that that was just a scalp trade but my core position my fast i didn't sell any shares of it all all right just one sec i've got an intruder all right. Well, it's good that you step away because here, let's get Dennis out of there. Uh, oh wait, are you back? No, I want to see the intro. AMC people trying to get me. No, it's my kid. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they, <laughs> they can't get, Dennis, Dennis, they can't get across the border. 
So. <laughs> well, there could be some in Canada too, Joel. <laughs> oh man, there you go. There goes. I'm sure there's there goes some AMC theory fanatics in Canada as well. Man. Oh jeez. Can let's, you check to see if someone's Canadian on Twitter? Let's bring I'm, Paul. I'm sure they are. Let's bring Paul Monica on. I don't think he's Canadian. Paul Monica is digital correspondent at CNN Business. Paul, good morning. I am not Canadian, but I do like hockey, and uh, thrilled that my Islanders are one win away from moving on to the next round. That's a big win against Boston, Paul. I mean, this is uh, Boston. Everybody thought Islanders didn't have a chance against Boston, especially, you know, since the Taylor Hall pickup. But all of a sudden, you know, they're, you got Barzell and Eberle with a nice couple goals, I believe. So they're looking good. <laughs> we'll take it. I didn't know this was. I didn't know this was a hockey show, but apparently, yeah, no, I know. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't invite I'll talk me on hockey, hockey the whole hour. Now, so. Dennis, now Dennis, you're gonna get you woke me get up. Hate, Paul woke me up. You're gonna get hate from Boston Bruin people now. I don't think yeah, um, Boston Bruins. I think there are too California. many hockey meme stocks out there, unfortunately. Oh, there you go, Paul. Yeah. There you go. That's fine. Is there H O C K? Is that a stock? I don't know. But I, Paul, I mean, I just got. I I know you were busy last week. You couldn't come on. I mean, your job. Must be absolutely crazy. I mean, you are in the media. You are, you know, you're you're the C- digital correspondent for CNN. You have to disseminate all this information. You have to write about it. I mean, how do you decide? I mean, with all these different things. I mean, do you get assignments? Do you come up with the ideas? I mean, how, how yeah, the hell do you uh, do it? It's a mix of both. I mean, I've been at CNN uh, this coming of November will be my 20th anniversary here. So I'm, uh, you know, kind of grizzled uh, veteran with uh, gray in my beard. So I have a little bit of leeway uh, with regards to what I get to write about. But of course, yeah, any newsroom, even in the uh, you know, work from home world that we're still at uh, for, uh, you know, for most people at CNN, it's a collaborative effort, you know, work very closely okay. with it to figure out what to cover and uh you know i I think for business sites and and you guys probably obviously know this as well the big fear was what's going to happen in a post-trump world Uh, but we've had our fair share of things to write about even with the more boring Biden administration so to speak because the meme stock revolution has kept everyone busy so i'm you know i so between cryptocurrencies and GameStop and AMC, been busy. there's you know a lot of things to write about. Even if politics has uh, you know not necessarily that. taken the back seat, but it's not as maybe compelling as a story to the markets as it was you know in the past four years. How how long have you been at CNN? Twenty years. Twenty years in November. Okay, so. All right, so you you were in the thick of things. So how would you compare the current environment to 1999? Yeah, I mean, I am struck by how similar this market with regards to certain pockets, particularly pockets. crypto, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Well, here's It's crypto, even more so than the meme stocks, to be honest. And I wrote a column for, for Standard Business last week about this very topic. In the late 90s, when I was working at uh, the late great Smart Money and, uh, and Red Herring before I joined uh cnn when i told people in casual conversations what i did for a living it immediately cab drivers you know average kind of folks on the street what do you think of qualcomm what do you think of cisco what do you think of this ipo then you had the great dot-com collapse you had enron you had worldcom you had then you know a period of calm with the housing market coming back, but then Lehman Brothers and the whole financial sector imploding. I, I had a good 15-year stretch where when I told people what I did for a living and where I worked, they then would just ask me if I ever see Anderson Cooper in the building. Now, when I tell people I work for CNN Business, the CNN part is almost the afterthought. They hear the business and they're like, what do you think of Tesla and Dogecoin? What do you think of Bitcoin? What do you think of Ether? I, I bought Coinbase, you know, after the direct listing. So that retail fervor is back and it's really focused, I think, on, on crypto, at least in my circle. That's what I'm finding, yeah. even more so than the meme stocks. I think the meme stocks still, by and large, is maybe more of a really focused trader phenomenon. I don't have that many people casually asking me about AMC or BlackBerry or GameStop, but people are always asking me about Bitcoin 
Bitcoin and Ether and Dogecoin and even Shiba Inu coin for crying out loud. <laughs> I don't even know what I, that one was. <laughs> I, I, I'm just curious. It's a joke on the joke. It's the meme based on the dog that Dogecoin is modeled after. Paul, I, I'm just curious, like, um, based on, you kind of already answered this a little bit, but, you know, from all the things that you guys, you write about, you yourself or, or, or your team, whether it's crypto or, or, or AMC or GameStop or, or whatever, what do you see the greatest reaction to? Like, good or bad, but I'm just curious, like, what is, what, what, what gets the most attention? I think when... I think the biggest attention comes from any time we, with either headlines or leads of stories, use superlatives that maybe make uh, traders angry. And and I will go back to a, a story I did, uh, you know, earlier in the year when Bitcoin had one of its first kind of mini meltdowns, and I just pointed out that it had like a twenty percent move from the high, which technically in old school gray beard what i was taught means it's a bear market and people were livid that i was calling it a bear market and to be fair i understand that yes when we discuss things as a bull market a bear market it's an artificial construct and it gets people worked up and bitcoin is admittedly not like any other asset on the planet or cryptocurrencies for that matter right now it's still a maturing industry So these kind of volatile moves are becoming more commonplace. And it may be unfair to say every big drop is a bear market because bear markets for, you know, for Bitcoin, I mean, they're, they're more like corrections in, in, in other assets. It seems like, no, if, if, if a big stock goes down 20, 30%, you can say it's a bear market. No, one's going to get all ticked off with Bitcoin 20%. It's kind of like it's, it's the morning. It's Tuesday. I mean that's that's true. That that that's that that's a feature, not a bug, right? So um all right, uh Paul, is is there anything on your radar for this week? There's a lot of events this week. We have the the Apple event going on right now. There's E three coming up next weekend. Um is there anything on your radar as far as you're watching uh maybe for potential news events? Yeah, I, I both uh of those events you mentioned are obviously going to be interesting. I'm uh, really intrigued by the fact that you have GameStop earnings later this week, but yes. also Chewy earnings later this week as well. And as any of the fans of uh, GameStop know, these companies are now sort of you know, intertwined in a respect because you had Ryan Cohen coming in from Chewy, the you know co-founder of that company, which has done an amazing job. One of the few companies that, you know, put its uh, you know, footprint in uh, the online commerce world, went toe-to-toe with Amazon and is still doing quite well. Cohen's not at Chewy anymore, but he has come in with a big investment in GameStop, has you know, shook up management there. George Sherman is out. They brought a lot of executives uh, from, uh, from Chewy and other online retail executives to come in. So I'm very fascinated to see how Chewy is doing because that's a legitimate success story right now and then gamestop which a a lot of people are bashing it and i'll be the first to say that it's probably had a bit of an excessive run but i understand the optimism because of cohen because of the shift in uh, a digital retail model and the fact that you know gaming is a legitimately growing business there's no reason why gamestop shouldn't be able to capitalize on some of the bigger picture trends that are favorable so uh, I'm fascinated to see how both those companies do with their financial results. Well, hopefully this time they actually take questions on their call, uh, not like last quarter. Paul and Monica exactly. is a digital correspondent at CNN Business. Paul, always a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. Uh, it is 825. And speaking of Ryan Cohen, do you guys yeah. remember, was it 2019 when he, he, is, he sold all of his Chewy stock, right? And he put all of it into Wells Fargo and Apple. Do you remember that? That was a three, two, three years ago. I don't remember that, but well, if he put it all in Wells Fargo three years ago, he probably did pretty good on that too. He put, he, he said he put all his money, all his. Oh, no, maybe not. Maybe three years ago is too long ago. Wells Fargo and well, it may have been two years. It may have been twenty nineteen. I don't know. Depends on the timing. Market timing is everything. No, I know, but it was it was Wells <laughs> Fargo and Apple, and like those were his two things, and that was it. That's what he said. It's like all right. 
Um, anyway. GameStop Game does report tomorrow night. Yes, they do. So this is going to be a big report, obviously. Gonna, um, it's going to move the stock price. I, I don't know if fundamentals matter. Like, I'm not sure totally. But if they say something like, I think what's going to matter more is do they have some plans? I mean, we know they had this NFT site that supposedly was put up by the company. Um, you know, are they going to say anything about NFTs? Are they going to say something about alternative business models? Because their current business model doesn't justify the price. But do they give you a glimpse into something that they might be planning that might justify a higher stock price? I think that's what's going to be important. So not so much how they did in the quarter, but what do they have coming? Like, do they have some cool ideas? Yes, we'll find out. I'll just say we hit, uh, we're hitting a, an area of potential resistance, potential with a capital P, capital O, going capitals all the way across. Uh, you had your three day high at 294. And then when you had that last bump up to 350, you had a high at 295.50. So there you are. You're trading above it in the pre market almost at 300. But as you can see by the daily charts, not much in there. Old time closing high, I believe, is three forty seven fifty. You absolutely just cannot be short any of these stocks. Um, yeah, even I, even going to the Wendy's this morning, I'll tell you how much I fear Reddit, and this is the truth: is I actually was short Wendy's overnight. Um, just just happened to have it in the overnight portfolio, and I saw Reddit talking about it. I woke up early this morning and covered this under twenty four dollars. Um, just because I was like, I actually temp was tempted to go long, but I'm like, I can't bring myself to pay up a buck for Wendy's, but I definitely don't want to be short it. It saved me a lot of money here because the stock is now $27 and 20 cents. Um, I don't know why Wendy's, I don't know why this is the stock du jour for Reddit. Uh, but I do know that Jim Cramer loves Wendy's. And when I saw Wendy's getting talked about on Reddit, I was like, Jim Cramer is bound to come and say something positive about this because I know Jim Cramer. I watch him all the time. He, I know he loves Wendy's. I'm putting two and two together saying he's <laughs> likely to jump on this bandwagon and that will move the stock. And that is exactly what happened after seven o'clock this morning. Why you see the big pop? I don't know. I think it was maybe at 731 if I'm getting the time right. But Jim Cramer came out. If we can show the Jim Cramer tweet, this really kickstarted it. Um, can yeah. you? Yeah, go to Jim Cramer, show the tweet, uh, because Reddit kickstarted this, but it was it was highly likely that Jim Cramer was going to jump on the bandwagon, and Cramer is very influential, especially when he starts talking. We saw what he did to Beyond Meat. You know, he caused a twenty point rally in Beyond Meat because he was basically saying, "Reddit, here's a stock for you, go get it." So, anyways, here's the here's the tweet from seven thirty one this morning. When you, if you look, there'll be another spike in the price right at that time, Joel. Wendy's a huge favorite of Mad Money on CNBC. Gets a nice push from Reddit. I think it deserves to be higher. So I saved myself putting two and two together at 6.30 or maybe it was even 6 o'clock this morning, getting up early to cover the Wendy's because when I was like, oh, Reddit's talking Wendy's, Kramer's bound to pump Wendy's as well today. And that's like the double. So you can see the big pop after that tweet. So save myself some money. I mean, this is just knowing your stocks, knowing who likes what. You have to. It's a stupid world that you have to know, like which influencer on TV likes the stock. But he, Jim Cramer, always has liked Wendy's. So I, I'm not surprised that he would come out and say something more positive about it. And now it's up 18. percent I mean, this is a huge move on no fundamental information for a fairly large sized company. Yeah, it is. It has major, major, major influence, and it so does Jim Cramer. Yeah, new all-time high by a, a, a wide margin. Uh, it's not the bacon triple cheeseburger that uh, the heart stopper. Uh, That's what he talks about. <laughs> Kramer always cracks me up. <laughs> oh, really? Talking about his wife, she loves the baconator. He says, "Yeah, oh, that's why baconator. I think about well. That's why I probably know." He always makes fun of his wife. She's like, I don't know why she just like attacks that baconator. <laughs> Kramer uh, is funny. Love him or hate him, he is funny. If you're looking for a potential target on this, I mean. <laughs> He just hit what 27, 65, 66. So just keep your eye on the pre-market high. And uh and then, you know, right before the open. It's gonna be a little bit of this is a New York oh no, it's a Nasdaq stock. So it's gonna be a big open up four four. I probably haven't seen a move in Wendy's like that in a long time. Not on no news. I mean no a twenty percent move in Wendy's. This is phenomenal move. 
Because a 20% move in it doesn't probably move. When's the last time we moved 20% on earnings? I, uh, yeah. I don't know if it ever has. This is a stock. You know, in a long time. Stock. And then you have a stock, maybe during, it might have been moving. The during, financial uh, crisis. Well, uh, well, yeah. or, the, or the COVID and, crisis, because yeah. it really got slaughtered during the COVID crisis. We know down like five bucks and then bounce back. But I mean, on no news here, take COVID crisis away. This is a phenomenally big move for a company that's fairly large. So this Reddit, you know, is just very influential. I know I, I know I, I, I say some things. You've got to respect the Reddit traders. And here I am, short one of their stocks. And I'm like, I got to get this covered. I got to get, I actually woke up because I just checked my phone and, and I just had to be scrolling through. I was like, Wendy's Reddit stock. I was like, that's not good news. And then I'm like, and then I'm like thinking, I'm like, oh man, Kramer likes Reddit and Kramer. I'm like putting it together at like, 5 30 this morning i'm like i gotta wake up and cover that position i went and i woke up and covered and you can see um i actually covered right around that low 24 as you can see it was trading it was actively from six to seven you could get covered in the 24s quite easily so you know and then obviously the blast off since then so save myself some money there just being scared of one Reddit and two Jim Cramer potentially pumping the stock. Just to understand the timeline here, you so you woke up and you went to Reddit. No, it's in my Twitter feed. Somebody was. I oh. I, I wake up. Oh. So I wake up in the middle of the night a couple times. I see what's going on. I sometimes scroll through my Twitter feed just like half asleep. Is there anything cool happening? Okay. And Wendy's was in there a couple times. I was like, oh. this is not good. I knew I had Wendy's in my overnight portfolio. Sometimes I don't remember what I had in my overnight portfolio, but I just remembered that one. And I was like, I know I'm short it. I was like, I got to go ahead and cover that. So I actually got up, went down to my computer. It's nice to work from home. Went in, covered my Wendy's, and then I went back to bed. <laughs> so in the in the six o'clock, I went back to bed for a little bit. But anyways, and then, you know, you wake up and obviously Wendy's is up 22% now. <laughs> I like pat myself on the back. That, so you, you say, you know, how is it uh, uh, when you lose money on a trade? How is that a good trade? That was a good trade. That was a good trade. I covered that low 24s. It's 28 bucks now. Being scared of Reddit saved me money. <laughs> All right. S&P's just take 3675, uh, 38 and a quarter. Only relevant you know, high, only relevant level ever in the SP. Uh, that was the high from uh May 10th. And uh just I don't think the Reddit traders are trading futures. I'm not sure how many people in the chat trade futures, but uh, you got the rollover this week. Uh, so there, that that action that you saw on the break on the um, on the outage break, I think you're going to see some more of that today as people roll over the futures contracts from the June to September. So this could be uh, one uh, one exciting day, couple days. So just you know, be careful trading with stops or. Just uh, respect your risk parameters because there is going to be a little extra volatility on top of everything else. Just a pile of secondary offerings last night, too. Yeah, so I wonder you were why. Listing them off. After four o'clock, some big names in there, too. And I'll, I'll let you do you. the list. Yeah, so I, I, I want to show you uh, in Benzing Pro. I, look at all the. So this is just, wait a minute. Here we go. Uh, this is Monday, right? Just from so, last night, so the Monday, secondary offerings. Go back at 4 p.m. and work your way upward. Right, and I'll tell Look you how many I, are in there. I found this right. I just went to my news feed. I went to categories. I went to news, and I went to offerings, and boom, every offering right there. So after the close yesterday, we had WB Carry, we had Leslie's, Kirby Dr Pepper, Playboy, Up FinTech, which is T I G R, uh, Etsy uh, Convertible Senior Notes, uh, Shake Shack Mixed Offering No Term Was Disclosed. Uh, that was just yesterday. This morning we have uh, Genius Sports. And uh, HSTS, so a lot of offerings in the last since the close, basically. You're going to continue to see this so um, happening because as you know, we have you know some irrational exuberance in pockets of the market, which we were just talking to, obviously with Paula Monica. Some of these companies are going to take advantage of this irrational exuberance and sell stock them. So you, you someone have to be careful when you get these huge moves that sometimes secondaries do follow. A lot of these companies have one thing in common. A lot of these company stock prices have been elevated in the short term here. So they're using that strength to raise some cash. I mean, TIGR has had a hell of a run. I mean, the stock has went from $15 to $27 in a week and a half. So if the company is going to you know, use an opportunity in a stock market rally to sell stock, now is the time. 
I mean, Etsy has come back a little bit, but it's a convertible offering, so not a straight up offering. Leslie's has been on a hell of a run too. We know this. This is a pick from Jason Rasnick gave us a while ago. Twenty two dollars up to thirty one dollars. I mean, this is sometimes what companies do. So um, they do knock the stock prices down. Believe it or not, I know in the AMC situation it didn't, but normally stocks, you know, go down. The quantitative uh, tac- the, the quantitative tactic to see when you see an offering is to sell the stock because they usually do the offerings below the current price to get them done. So in some cases they can get them done you know a little more easily than others and it's not as much in the hole. In other cases they got to take them way down to get them done. Um, in most of these cases, a lot of these stocks, there probably is going to be some demand because these stocks are in uptrends. But I mean, Playboy was up five bucks yesterday. It's giving it all back. So just because yeah, the they're offering. just so they're, they they're move clo- price. Yeah, they're they're closely held shares by the company. Uh, they were the secondary offering after the IPO. But you just better be careful when when they're senior convertible offerings because that means old people like us are selling. So That's just exactly. uh, to, just uh, just. Uh, just, just just be careful. Joel's, try, Joel's trying here. He'll be here <laughs> all week. Yeah, that, 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 Baby that. boomer offerings is what they're going to be coming up with next. Yeah, we're boomers, Joel. I'm a boomer, too. I didn't no, even know we're, you, What you defines you're, a boomer? You're, no, you're I'm not. a bust. You are, I don't they, know what they, the they all hell call you me are. boomer, too. The boomer I didn't no, mind. You know, it's the derogatory no, names I didn't like. But what do they call... What 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 is what defines a boomer? It's uh, uh, it's like... Well, the boom bust and echo. Yeah, you you are not a, a baby boomer. I'm a bust. I, I was a bust. No. You're a total bust. Yeah. I, I was the a baby bust. boomers are are you know, there's like six different generations, right? And the boomers are forty six to sixty four. You're you're a gener they call you wait, like, a bust. I was seventy six on the bust generation. No, that makes you Gen X, man. That makes you Gen X. No, Gen X? yeah, yeah, you couldn't make it I gotta into learn the my, X. Demo, my, my I gotta learn all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, everybody, a lot of people call me Boomer, so I guess I, know, uh, I guess not. they meant that. I guess they meant to send those Boomer, to you, Joel. To send me to me. You hear like this: Boomer is more a mentality. It is not your age. No. It is your mentality. So my mentality is old. How about this one? <laughs> no, this is kind of weird because they have Generation Jones, and that's from fifty-five to sixty-five. So what's that? Uh, not I don't a, know. Everybody named Jones from fifty-five. to that's not a thing. I'm bringing us back here. Bringing us back. Okay. Oh, Spencer's trying. Hey, to hey, hey. Here's, the one. Here's the headline I missed uh, yesterday. Co-Star Group. Uh, who, Co-Star. Who, who asked about this in the chat? CSGP. Who asked about this in the chat? They announced a 10 for 1 split. Yeah. I saw a bit up last night. It hit my pro. Um, it didn't really trade. It was bit up last night. Dino, Two shares traded 840. Dino morning, asked but... about this. CSGP. 10 for 1 split. They probably need it. It's $800 stock. Good for them. Uh, and if I've learned nothing in the last year, I've learned that uh, stocks go up on splits, apparently. What, what's the symbol on that? CSGP. CSGP. Some, you know what some that odd is? lots were trading up like 40 points on this last night. I have no idea. This is thinly traded stock, Joel. So, um, you know, not super thin, but actually for an $800 <laughs> stock, it's not bad, actually. But I don't know. Typically, these stocks do pop on stock splits. So I would be very surprised if the stock wasn't up. Three to four percent this morning. Uh, so. If if I uh, if I know this correct, do you guys know what this company is or what it does? Well, I just looked it up. So you tell real me. estate, right? Yeah, real estate listing company. Yep, that's right. That's right. Yep, you can find just about any commercial any commercial property you want anywhere. Right? Uh, they get people. And that was probably a play on the whole the whole real estate thing too. Uh, but uh, yeah, thin stock split flat probably bid up right now. I. Hard to make a call. It's it's there. really not. There's no interest here because it's eight hundred dollars stock. But I think I I think it probably trades higher. Like it was trading up on odd lots last night. There was no round lots, meaning a full hundred shares. Yeah. I don't believe it traded any full hundred shares last night, but a few odd lots trade higher. I can see it is uh, there is a thirty one share offer. This is if you got the ARCA book, you can see this. There's a thirty one share offer at eight sixty. So that's up 33 points. That's the best offer. Best bid is an They're looking at their daily charts here, and they're seeing the one, two, three, four highs. I think, right I think it could go higher than that. Yeah, yeah. I, that's on not what would be up on a, a stock split news. I don't know. It, actually, it's up 33 points. It's probably where – that's probably where I would think it – you're right, Joel. You look at those those highs there. It's probably where I would think it would maybe want to go. 
I, I would I would assume it probably goes higher. I have no position in it. I would assume it probably goes higher just because they like stock splits. First time we ever talked about CoStar Group. And uh, yeah, history, first you know? time ever, yeah. Yes, it yeah. is. Definitely the first time for that. Uh, Chat's asking how high Clover can go. Man, can you just imagine what a, ro- <laughs> what a roller coaster of emotions? If if you've been long like all year, yeah. what a roller coaster of emotions? You watch yeah. it go from 17 to 6, back basically to 12, yeah, uh, basically the six. And now Reddit. <laughs> and now Reddit trade is the short squeeze trade is bailing you out. Yeah, I, great yeah. for you. Great for you if if you've held all this uh, time. I, I screwed this trade right up because, like I said, I bought a lot of those short squeeze stocks when I felt like when the Bed Bath and Beyond one, I was like they might start squeezing some of these names. I bought this. I can't remember. Like it was like four or five days ago, right? I think I probably paid like eight bucks for this, and it quickly ran to ten. And I was like, that's a good trade. I quickly sold the gain. I think I made like 15% on my money in a day. And I was like, that's pretty good. Obviously, sold way too soon. <laughs> it's $16 now. So, I mean, I guess that goes to show you, you know, these squeezes go on for more than a day sometimes. And this one is obviously in full squeeze mode here now. Where the party ends, who knows? You could go to the Kenny Glick while well, he took out 12 and a half and 15. Now you think 17 and a half, he could take out 17 and a half, then you start thinking about 20, but they can pull the rug from it any time too. So now there's a lot of risk. So it just doubled in four days. So if you're buying here, you're buying somebody else's profits. Is it this, uh, uh, I'm going to try the name. Oh, God. Seamus <laughs> Papapatia. That actually wasn't bad. Really? Yeah. What is, is it, it? Isn't it Shamoth? It's Chamath. You're both Chamath. wrong. You're both wrong. Chamath? Yeah. I should know that because I'm trying to teach my six year old S H C H. So Chamath. So it's got I called it Shamoth. My yeah. my six year old would have called it Shamath too, because he gets the sh and the ch. So I gotta go with the ch. Chamath. Chamath polyhopatia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. holy Papa. I forgot Spencer, I gotta sound it out. Uh for you, Clover Reddit Price. and you too, uh Chamath, if you're listening. Uh seventeen bucks. Uh that pop that you had in January. You got to seventeen forty five going right there with the Kenny Glick theory. It looks someone said, you know what? I'm not holding out for seventeen. Actually, I'm hitting every bit over sixteen ninety. So you had a bracket where you had a high at sixteen ninety three, and you had a bracket where your high was sixteen ninety four. So maybe seventeen will hold up here. If not, old time high seventeen forty five. Wow! Just the way that this stock market has bailed out so many people who were underwater in a lot of these stocks just a few weeks ago, and. The growth turn, we talked about the growth turn a couple of weeks ago, and now you've got short squeezes going on and the growth names. I mean, Fubo. Oh. I'm, I'm ticked off. I bought Fubo, too. I bought it 20 bucks. We talked about it on the show. I sold it 25 I thought it was a good trade. 25 It's 31 <laughs> Yeah, someone was talking Selling about that too yesterday. Soon again. Yep. Yep. Uh, and wasn't there a short seller in Clover? I sure hope he. Covered yeah. Well, his well, no, no. There was a short report, but a short report. They weren't short. It was Hindenburg, and they came out and with their report. But then they said, "We're we're not short. We just think this company sinks." Oh man! Then why the hell spend the money and time doing a report? For the good of the market, Joel. Oh, Jesus, Murphy. Okay. <laughs> they were scared to short stocks back then. Everybody yeah, was scared. They, let's, give, let's give them like it was scary to short stocks. It was kind of scary to short stocks now, too. <laughs> what can I say? All right. Uh, let, Such let's, an interesting market. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it, Dennis. Interesting. You want to hear the stat? Uh, this is from Callie Cox. Uh, she's uh, from Ally Invest. She had a great one yesterday. Uh, the, the S&P uh, hasn't traded in a range Greater than one percent. So you think about like the daily candle. Uh, think about that as a percent of uh, of the price. Uh, the range of that candle as a percent of price. S and P hasn't traded in a range larger than one percent for eleven straight days. At the same time, AMC has traded in in a range of at least ten percent for ten straight days. So when you when you talk about pockets, it's all about pockets, right? Because the overall pockets. Market, overall market is boring, is snooze fest. Yeah. Pockets are really, really fun right now. Here is my question to you and to the chat. At what point in time, if these pockets of strength, like we're seeing Wendy's today continue, at what point in time do they start selling the mega caps, which have no hope of probably getting, you know, these, you know, Reddit rallies, Too big. start just moving money into small cap speculative names? Um, 
it, we haven't seen that sell. I mean, Facebook made a new all-time high yesterday. We haven't seen really massive selling in the mega caps here yet. They haven't been participating, but they haven't been getting sold either too much. Is there a point in time where if this continues, that money starts rotating out of mega caps because it's just not making enough money? Where And I know the same thing. I buy some of these small speculative names. You get a lucky one here, you know, even on the Clover, and you make 15% in a few hours. And you think, why am I money in Amazon when I make 15% on Clover in a few hours? I mean, I've got, I catch myself doing it, you know, and I've obviously a seasoned investor for 22 years. So at what point in time does this not put pressure on the mega caps eventually, if this continues? That's, that's the question. That that right there makes me not want to be overweight mega caps. That that is the only question to be asking right now. Uh, yeah, it makes me not want to be overweight mega caps. It's the reason that I was buying insurance, which is you know, some of it's no good now. But it's a reason I'm I'm still concerned on some of the overall market here. It's just these pockets of strength, the speculative nature. You are recreating and you are moving some investors from being very conservative to more speculative and higher risk takers. I think there's a case here that we've been in a mega cap. Let's just you know sit back and I'll, I'll let you guys take it from here. But but let's just look at where we've been in the last ten years. We've been in a market dominated by mega caps, dominated by the Amazons and the Apples and the Googles and the Microsofts. All you know these stocks are what's carried us for the last decade. So could the 2020s be the decade of the small cap? Is this a movement that's going to continue? to the question of the chat too does this continue should we start maybe looking at you know even if you want to look at iwm maybe moving some of the money from you know the diamonds or the mega caps or from even the Qs. Qs have some smaller stocks but you know mostly mega caps into like some of the smaller caps maybe iwm is going to go into a period of outperformance where it's underperformed for forever i mean if you look at the iwm relative and, and just you know obviously backing out the last six months but if you really look at the performance of IWM from like 2010 to 2020, mm -hmm. it hasn't been great. So maybe we're moving into this period where it is going to be small caps that are going to start to outperform. Uh, Sam Beckinsale says mega caps are, are like bonds. You know, he's not entirely wrong because they're not going to go up 100%. They might start going down, though, if the money starts to come out of this stuff in order to get more speculative in nature. I mean, a speculative poof bubble and then that will all change and maybe that's what we see happen too uh but i know you, you're loaded up in some mega cap still too joel are you not or how's your yeah i mean i get more and more cash every day unfortunately um you know what dennis they hit the market uh in january when we had this effect but why do they necessarily just have to go down Maybe they'll just go absolutely nowhere. Well, that's no good either, though. I don't no, want they, my stocks to go nowhere. I want to make money. Yeah, I, mean, I, that's I think point. it's a it's a it's a shift. I think it's a it's a fundamental shift, and it's been going on long enough where you know you have to consider it a turning point, right? So I, I. I, I have to say you have to lean the other way, and how I'm gonna you know reallocate my. Uh, portfolio is going to be tough but um you know maybe just stick with what i have and go more into it but it, it's i mean it's a hard trend it's a hard trend to ignore and what it's gotten started and um you it, know it doesn't feel like everything it, it not, doesn't feel nothing like a blip seems like right now. Down. It, it doesn't feel like a blip anymore though like it felt like in january okay well this is the january effect right the, the laggards start to lead and you get an over and then you get you know reddit moving some stocks but it's been going on for long enough now that you've got to respect the reddit traders and you've got to respect even the amc traders and the movement and the power that these groups of individuals have you know where they call them apes or what you want to call them but at a certain point in time you're going to have money managers major money managers saying I'm underperforming because I'm invested all in, you know, these boring mega cap stocks and all this money's moving. And if you start seeing institutional money start chasing some of these meme stocks or some of these smaller names, that can influence the overall market as well. So I don't know. First thing, is I'm sure they are already. Uh, but second, I don't. I think institutional money is very slow to adapt. So I would challenge that. I think institutional money, for one, you know, these funds have, you know, obviously have to change certain parameters, you know, that they can invest under because, you know, they've got to go to their their groups. They can't just all of a sudden change the parameters and the kinds of companies they're investing in. Sure. There's, you know, it's, sure. it's laid out there. It takes time. 
But I don't know. I think this market's turning to just be more speculative in nature in general. Yeah. And maybe that trend continues. Like we can just keep pooing it. But maybe we've got to start looking at, you know, investing. And maybe we don't pick the stocks. Maybe we just look to IWM. Can we bring up a 10-year chart of IWM, Joel, and just see if my thesis holds water? You know, because I'm going just from my head. But I'm assuming oh, you're the right. QQQs have massively outperformed the IWM oh, yeah. in the last 10 yeah. years. Yeah, you're right. Let's just kind of look and just right. just okay, visualize let me, it. Let me make it big. Yeah. I mean, look at that. I mean, 10 years going back to 2010. I mean, yeah. it did nothing from 10, 11, 12, 13, but bumped then we up started a little to bit go. of 14. Yeah, but still, look at look at 14 and 15. Yeah. And then uh and then you know you bring up uh the cash S and P and you got it, you got a different just, chart here. I I'll, I'll just show you direct, you know, compare the direct correlation IWM versus the Q's going back to 20, whatever. There 20. you go. There you go. I mean Q's crushed it. Q's crashed oh, it. If you're buying QQQ, you're buying what? What's the top like five well, components? I, I, I know. Thirty percent of the index. We know that's yeah. the Fang stocks. We know that's not. Yeah. Well, that's not because of like Pepsi, right? That's yeah. Because, that's because of the of the Fang stocks. So, yeah. so anyway, um, yeah, crushed it. Uh, what I was gonna say before is, can you imagine being like some hedge fund manager and like you're getting spanked by like retail traders? Imagine trying to like justify your fees yeah. to your investors. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think they have to do changes. I think they're going to start oh, looking at some of this stuff. So you get real money chasing some of these memes. So I'm not saying everybody's going to pile an AMC. So I'm not just saying that. I'm just saying that they might be looking for the next big, ne the next AMC. So, you know, again, some of this is value oriented, but some of this is just I just don't see them being able to move Amazon and, you know, pile in, no. let's get dry. And why? What's the story? It, 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 the movement is against, you know, the mega caps that are taking over the world. That's kind of the movement, too. So I think in, like like I, what I did, I was in, I'm starting to reallocate slowly in my long term portfolio, which is definitely technology heavy, more more so than not just because those stocks have outperformed so long that they've just grown to be Goliath, some of those in my portfolio. But um, I started selling some cues um, and looking at, you know, starting to try to maybe, I don't know if I'm going to buy IWM, but looking at a smaller stocks, not necessarily speculative penny stocks, but just yeah. maybe this is going to be the era of the small cap. Maybe the small cap comes back and plays catch up. That's just, you know, that's just what I'm posing out there today. Uh, at the same time, here's a headline from Bloomberg. Um, Broad-based commodity ETFs are seeing a boom in investor interest. <laughs> I don't know. I'm still not a fan of the commodities for the simple reason is that I think the younger generation isn't a fan of dirty energy. So I don't think it's going to be like we've had such a move in oil already. You know, am I coming in here and buying the XLE now after, you know, we've had, you know, a, a, a doubling of a lot of those stocks in just a few months? I mean, ExxonMobil, which is one of the biggest components in all these indexes, went from 30 to 60. It has been a phenomenal move in 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 four and a half months. It, we kind of been to the Dallas. There. We've been kind of poo pooing uh, the move in oil though for a long time. I've been poo pooing I mean, the move yeah. in oil for a decade, for five <laughs> for years, not decade, but for right. years. I sold all my oil stocks back in 2018, and it was a good move. I had Exxon Mobil in my long term portfolio for a long time. I sold it at ninety five dollars, I believe, because I thought that dirty energy wasn't the future. So, the, which is a good call. The stock's sixty dollars now. So here's three years later. It did, I didn't recover and rebuy them at thirty, which obviously I should have. Hindsight, hindsight capital is twenty right. twenty. But I mean, I still don't think this movement of this younger generation is going to be coming. And let's buy Exxon Mobil. No, you know, like no. it, it. I think this. I think the younger generation does care about the environment. So I think if you're still looking at that, I just don't see the secular change here for oil to be the future. I think oil is the past. So, you know, then there's lots of other, you know, plays. I'm not saying oil's going away. I'm just saying I don't know if I want to be buying oil after some of these stocks have had 100% upwinds here. Hey, what about, uh, and we talked about this before, uh, you know, Bitcoin affecting the overall market. You're not, you're not it, seeing that now. It hasn't, it hasn't been. No. Yeah. I mean, well, the overall not... market affected Bitcoin first, though, which we called. Because you had the growth names that all got hammered, and then it was predictable. The only thing that was holding up was crypto, and now crypto is sold off. And the money that's come out of crypto has went back into the growth names. It's almost like that speculative cash that was in crypto is now coming back into growth stocks or storied stocks. 
to a certain extent. Yeah. Wouldn't you say, Spencer? I mean, that's what we've seen yeah. happen in the last couple of weeks. I mean, Growth names and the speculative stocks got a bit again. Yeah. And crypto cannot catch a bit. Yeah. I, I'll never forget how crypto sold off in March of last year when we all assumed that crypto was this uncorrelated asset that was going to do what, whatever it wanted to do. Was it and, last year? And, yeah, and, in COVID, he's talking. And, 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 wow. and, yet, and yet, when we came to a real crisis and every asset was selling off, so, so too it got it. hammered. Uh, it sort of blew my mind. I'll, I'll never, I don't think I'll ever be able to get past that because it was, it was, a, it was our first true test of a black swan event and Bitcoin failed the test. Now, that being I, said, I agree. Right. Uh, th th that being said, uh, to Dennis's point, you're exactly right. A lot of this growth tech is, uh, stopped going down at least right and some of it's come a back lot. a lot back i mean a you're lot. gonna have this might be a good segue into the xpv ceo who you're going to have on here in not, just a few not, months. not the ceo sorry the president the vice the, the president the president yeah. xpv yeah. So, sorry about that but i mean the stock you know xpv look at the comeback in this thing i, I mean we were back when you know everybody hated growth names may 13 22 dollars it's 39 dollars here now the stock is up 80 percent in one two Whoa. three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve in 15 trading sessions the stock's up over 80 percent it's an incredible comeback now that being said people are saying buy growth now i mean this looks to me like you're you know you've had the big move the easy money has been made um, when it, the stocks were oversold, these stocks are not oversold anymore. The Fubos are not oversold anymore. They've come back nicely. You know, Fisker has come back big time too, 10 to 17. Ride, we know for our buddy Marcus, has come back significantly in the last 15 trading sessions. This has been, you know, really three to four weeks. We have turned, seen a complete turnaround in some of these growth names, some of these speculative growth names. Um, so anyways, an XPEV, obviously one of the biggest beneficiaries of that as well. Yeah, nine of the 10 last sessions, that's been higher. And uh, wow, what a move. Not much here. Uh, we're probably trading up at this high right here. We'll look at uh, 39.24. Not quite there yet, but if you're looking for a potential target, wow, nice move here. I think I just counted nine out of 10 uh, last sessions were Huge. to the upside. Yeah. So uh, we're going to have Brian Gu on in a couple minutes. He's the vice chairman and president of uh, uh, Xpung. Uh, just as we wrap up this hour, though, someone in chat um, was asking, uh, if we can go back to Clover for a second, they were asking about, did, did we say that Clover will hit an all-time high today? No, we definitely did not say that. And here was why we didn't say that, because we don't know. Okay, Nobody knows. Anything. If you are coming to this show and you're looking for us to tell you where a stock is going to go, that that's not that's not it. What what Joel can do is Joel can, get, Joel can give you a level that might act as support or resistance in the future. But he's not saying the stock is going to go here. It's going to go there. It's going to go up up x uh wait up x percent or down x percent. That's not what we're saying. We don't. Any, anyone who's saying they know is lying to you. Nobody it's, knows anything. Lying to you. Could Clover get to an all time high today? Yes, it could. Could it not? Yes, it could not. <laughs> like, uh, I, I'm sorry, but like that's 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 how it is, right? That's just how it is. So we don't know. So if that's what you're, you're looking for, I'm, I'm sorry, you're not going to get it from from us. We give trading ideas, we give trading opinions. We like a stock, we don't like a stock, but nobody knows anything. Again, you know, any type of opinion we get on this show, take it just as an opinion. You know, we are not investment advisors. We don't know where anything is, you know, going to go any better than the investment advisors probably do. We're just doing opinions. When stocks have big moves like this, it's for me, I, I sell too early, but I love to sell into upside capitulation. Clover's feels yeah. like upside capitulation day. It's traded 33 million shares here in the pre-market at 1617. Could it go to 20 though? Could it go? It could go anywhere. When it's got this kind of volume in the pre-market and it's got this kind of hype on Reddit and social media, it can go anywhere. So, I mean, I, it's 17, hard to trade this kind of stuff. 17's what it hit in the pre-market, all-time high, 17.45. I'm going to hop off here and let Spencer do the interview. Hey, I'm going to no, go over. Too. We oh, missed wait. a lot of tickers. Oh. I'm going to hop over wait. to pre – what? Do you see what Sky Daniel said in chat? I put it up on the screen. Uh, no. <laughs> I'm all in, and if I lose my money, I'm blaming Joel. 
That's okay. I blame Joel for everything yeah, as well. All so. right. I got to hop Joel's on. Join me at BrewMarketPrep.com. I'll cover some tickers. All right. Me. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. Uh, I want to bring on Brian Gear here. Uh, very excited for this conversation. Uh, he is the vice chairman and president of Expon. You all know, know the ticker XPEV joining me now. I know it's late. Brian, thank you so much for joining me today. Glad to be here. All right. I guess we should probably start with uh, the new, the new, the new model, right? The new car, the P5, which you unveiled, uh, what now? Two months ago, uh, right? Back in April. Yeah, about two months ago in April. Time, time flies. Uh, tell us about this model. What's different about it from from the uh, the G3 and the P7? Well, the third model is called the P5. Uh, it's actually targeting a very large segment in Chinese auto market. It's actually uh, the family sedan market. Uh, if you just picture it, it's actually uh, competing uh, with the names like Camry, like Accord, like Passat. So that's uh, obviously a very large segment uh, for us. Uh, the vehicle is based on our um, uh, platform, and a pure electric platform, what we call the A-class platform, which is shares a lot of parts with G3. So it has a lot of the cost advantages. But, sim sim but on the other hand, it actually has a number of very unique um, characteristics. It will have LiDAR in its sensor package. So if you you know think about it, this will be the world's first production vehicle incorporating LiDAR in its uh, sensor uh, suite. Uh, it also has a smart cabin design with very large space. Uh, also, we actually gonna introduce a number of very unique uh, of the innovative um, sort of small cabin features, for example, movie theater mode, uh, the the breakfast mode, and also the, um, um, the 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 sleeping, the camping mode. All that I think will be packed in a very attractively priced uh, uh, package. So we're very excited about it. Uh, we'll be launching this uh, delivery uh, starting the beginning of the fourth quarter. So it will be another catalyst for our growth this year. Since you mentioned LiDAR, uh, LiDAR, you know there are some people, and I won't name names, uh, but y you know them. Some people who uh, don't believe in LiDAR as, as a technology as it relates to, to full self driving. Uh, what, wh why is LiDAR the way? Well, we think uh, uh, there's a number of benefits to have LiDAR technology in your sensor package. First of all, it gave you a lot more information. So you have safety redundancy uh, in your uh, autonomous driving software. Uh, we don't use LiDAR for primary uh, sort of sensor. We actually still use camera as our primary sensor, but LiDAR will give you additional information to provide additional safety that's needed for city driving modes. Right now, our, our autonomous driving capability is mostly on highway and closed uh, 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 roads. But we want to expand that to city artery roads, and that's a lot more complex than highway. And that with lidar, uh, this is actually very, very much needed. Another reason I think we all have lidar in our uh, vehicle is the price of lidar is coming down very dramatically. So we think uh, by the time we launch our P5, it will have actually the right cost structure, so we can absorb it in our mid-segment pricing. So that's why it's also available. And just to confirm, I believe you just said it, but you're, you're still on on track for a Q4 commercial launch. Absolutely, oh, yes. Five? Okay. Um, speaking of um, you know uh, sales and 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 launches, you're, you're coming off a really really strong month in terms of uh, uh, sales uh, deliveries. Uh, Neo can't really say the same. What what was behind the strong the strong May you had? Well, I think there's a number of factors. Uh, first of all, we are targeting a very large segment in China versus Neo and the Auto. Those are more of a premium or luxury segment. We're targeting what we call the mid to high segment. Uh, that's actually the largest uh, auto segment in China. Secondly, is that we actually have a lot more um, product uh, sort of uh, rollout momentum compared to our peers. For example, you mentioned P5. It will actually be the uh, the new model this year, whereas our competitors does not have a new model this year. So we will have additional catalysts. The thirdly is that um, we are very focused on technology. So if you look at you know the recent launches of our P7, and it's also the NGP, which we call the uh, the navigation pilot guided pilot, uh, which is a, a, a one of the autonomous driving features. Uh, it is actually the best on the road, uh, competing to with our peers. So all that, I think uh, the rollout of the technology, the rollout of new models 
give us a much better momentum uh, in terms of delivery volume and sales. All right. Uh, here's a question I was going to ask later, but it's in chat. So I might as well just ask it now from Michael. Uh, when are you planning on expanding to the U.S.? Well, U.S. is a big market, but it's also a very difficult market to crack. I mean, to establish a good brand in U.S., you have to take a lot, lot of patience. And we want to be prudent. Uh, we obviously want to focus on China market first, but we already started expanding to Europe uh, with, uh, you know, I would say the small test water exercises in Norway, and we have plans to expand to other European countries. I think U.S. probably be behind that effort. So we'll, we'll be there, but I think it'll take a little longer. Um, can you give like an overall state of like e the e EV penetration in China, uh, maybe as it relates to Europe or as it relates to, to, the, to the U.S.? Uh, speak a little bit like to just to that market and the, the EV penetration there. Well, I think EV is always uh, been an uh, area that um, you can see a lot of the, the government and consumer forces that's been focused on in the last few years. You know, traditionally, I think it's been uh, pushed by government subsidies and, and a lot of the policies, but that's mostly have been driven the, um, I would say, the 2B market, the taxis, the mobility, the operating vehicles. But the last year or two, what you see is actually an explosion on the consumer market. You know, so then, you know, companies like ourselves, even with Tesla, has done very well in China because consumers are now really embracing EV and more specifically smart EVs as, as a product that they want to own. So if you look at the penetration rate a year ago, EV is probably less than 5% of all auto sales in China. But as, you know, recent as, you know, last couple of months, the EV penetration is approaching 10%. And for some of the large cities, let's say Shanghai, Shenzhen, Beijing, uh, and you're looking at about over 20% EV penetration in terms of auto sales. So that's very exciting because, you know, if you look at other sort of uh, um, technology segments, when you have the penetration rate exceeding double digit, the growth actually takes off because people are getting more used to having those products and they get the, the consumers embracing and then they're, they're actually more familiar with charging and, and using EVs. So I think, uh, you know, you are start to see the acceleration of that uh, movement uh, as we approach, you know, across the double digit penetration rate. And when that if 10% if is the magic number, when when do you see us getting there? Well, we'll, we'll cross 10% in the next couple of months. Okay. I mean, that's where we are in terms of nationwide penetration. Okay. In the big cities, it's already above 10%. Okay. Um, when will we get to full self-driving? You, you guys offer uh, something similar, but but not quite uh, right now. You offer advanced driver assistance. Uh, it's been a really, really hard technology to, 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 to develop. But uh, how far down the line are we? How far away are we from real full self-driving? I think it will be a long way. I mean, I think to be commercially viable, yeah. that technology will take years. I mean, maybe five to 10 years, I would say. Okay. Uh, First of all, you need to have the government regulation in place to allow full self-driving. It's not easy. It's not easy to change the mindset of the you know, regulators as well as getting the consumers to get comfortable having full self-driving on the road. Secondly, on a technology front, I think it was still a way to go from really having the safety sort of a, a, a profile that you can be confident about in a full self-driving. So I think that is you know, you will probably start to see testing areas expand from a small region to slightly larger in certain, you know, areas in China. But for a real full uh, uh, autonomous driving, uh, that probably, I think, uh, in the five to 10 years. I got to ask you about uh, semiconductors. I know you've said that the shortage is baked into your numbers already, but how are you feeling the pain and with the global shortage of chips right now? It's it's quite difficult at the moment. If you look at supply chain specifically to chips, uh, you know, um, I think uh, we are doing everything we can to make sure uh, we you know, uh, are meeting our you know delivery targets. Um, I think uh, you know the, the industry is is really seeing a crunch uh, this quarter. Um, I think uh, next two quarters we will start to see some easing, but I don't think the the recovery will be uh, uh, full until early next year. So I think it will be. Uh, quite some time to, but on the other hand, I think we are doing better than our you know peers, especially the large uh, quantity OEMs. They are dealing with you know hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of units a month. We're talking talking about thousands of months. So 
we we have a lot more flexibility and we can be more nimble, but it's hurting everybody and constraining uh, our ability to deliver. So the simple fact that you don't deliver as many cars is helpful when there's a supply crunch in a key ingredient in one. I guess that makes sense. I guess. Well, it's a, it's a, it's sort of a, I don't know whether it's a good problem, but obviously we have a very strong order uh, momentum that right. give us the confidence that, 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 you know, we, we, we see the growth, but on, on the other hand, we want to deliver more uh, to our customers because having people wait for many months, it's, it's not a good customer experience. And also it will sometimes, buying attrition because people just can't wait any longer. Right. Uh, and one more before I let you go, uh, I guess, who does uh, Xpeng see as its biggest competitor right now? Is it is it Tesla? Uh, is it Neo? Is it both? Is it somebody else? If you look at the uh, the segment that we're competing, uh, I think, uh, and also the hallmark of using technology as uh, the, 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 uh, the, the focus, uh, part of Tesla is closest to us. Um, we actually probably the only direct competitor to uh, Tesla Model 3 is our P7. I mean, if you look at the size as well as the technology, uh, so far, and also price, uh, we're pretty similar. We have some overlap in the price range. Um, so I think Tesla obviously is a, is, a, is a big competitor. But at the same time, I think we have a large uh, segment that we focus on. Uh, we, our low end of the segment, uh, Tesla does not go down that well. So we compete with some domestic uh, manufacturing the 150,000 to 250,000 range, and then the uh, lot higher end uh, from the 250,000 to 350,000, we start to see you know some of the names like Neo and others. Uh, but I think Tesla straddles uh, that segment a little bit. So so we actually compete um, from a technology perspective. Uh, I think Tesla is probably most comparable to us, and from the price segment, will be a number of uh, domestic peers that that also uh, compete with us. All right, uh, one more. This is from the chat. Uh, Samet's asking about a joint venture between Xiaomi and Xpeng. I don't know if you can speak to that. Uh, I don't. I don't know about that personally. Well, we don't have a JV right now. I mean, it's a company that has supported us when we were a private company. They were one of our investors. But Xiaomi also in, in announced that they're doing auto. Uh, they kind of launch their own auto business themselves. Okay. So, so we, we we're seeing them as a, as a friend, but you know, in the long run, potentially a competitor. Uh, but I think it's all healthy because I think uh, the more high quality names entering this race with better product appeal to consumers, it's going to expand the pie. Just like what we saw last year when Model 3 lowered the price, we all benefited from an enlarged uh, consumer you know, segment for, for that uh, uh, product line. So I think uh, it, in our mind and having a good uh, a competing product with good consumer appeal and help us convert from ICE uh, the gas engine vehicle to smart EV vehicles is always good for us. Right. It's not a zero-sum game. It, there's there's room. There's enough it, pie to go around. It, uh, yeah. It's plenty of uh, room. It's a, such right. a, you know, we're still at 10%, let's say. There's still a large uh, you know, gas engine market that waiting to be converted. Right. So so we're excited to see, see that happen soon. All right. Brian Gu is the vice, pre uh, vice chairman and president of XPong. Ticker XPEV is up on the screen. Brian, I know it's late, so I appreciate you uh, staying up and joining me today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good talking to you. All right. I uh, hope you guys like that. We're trying to bring you more executives. Uh, this is, you know, uh, when the EV uh, mania sort of went, went crazy, and I'll bring up a chart uh, of, of XPong uh, in, in a second here. But when, when all that sort of went crazy, there is this, this dichotomy between uh, companies that are actually making cars and ones that aren't. And, and this is one that is actually making cars, right? They actually have production, uh, which you can't say about um, every EV company out there. You can't say about some, some of those companies that went public via SPAC. Um, so that's definitely an argument in the, uh, or a check in, in, in the right column for, for uh, Xpeng, and and if you haven't looked into the the P5, which is is their new model that they unveiled uh, back in April, and it's going to uh, launch later later this year, you should check it out. The, the, obviously, I can't speak to you know the car itself because I've never seen one, but the videos look really cool. Um, you know, this is early stage company. They got a long way to go. They got a long way to prove themselves, and they're they're up against uh, Tesla, which is a juggernaut. So, you know, by no means is is this a sure thing, but. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope you got value out of that. We're trying to bring more execs on. And um, 
Uh, they don't have to be in any particular market, any particular industry. Uh, could be U.S., could be global, can be a growth sector like EVs, could be something more traditional. Um, whatever you want to see, we will do our best to uh, to bring them uh, to you. So um, thank you so much to Brian Gu for, uh, for stopping by today. I tried to ask a few questions from the chat. I know there is more. I didn't get to them. I, I apologize, but there's only so much time and didn't want to keep him too long because he's like 12 hours ahead of us. So I know it's late uh, for him. So uh, yeah, whoever you want to see, guys, email us. Email shows at benzinga.com. Okay, if you have a a particular guest you want to see on the show, a particular CEO, uh, let me I'll put it up on the screen here. Shows at benzinga.com. Email with any feedback to that address. It goes to a bunch of people here. And we take the request seriously. If you say there's somebody you, you want to see, we will do our best to to find that person. Kim Rivers from Truly Fabian Dunn. Kim Rivers has been on our show before. She has spoke at several uh, Benzinga conferences. I can get her on. Now I got to go write this down. Don't put it in chat. If you put it in chat, I'm going to forget. But I'm running Kim, Kim Rivers down right now. Um, if you put it in chat, uh, I, I will definitely not. I may not see it. Or I may see it and then just forget. So email us, shows at Um And yeah. So I hope we did a better job today of covering more tickers. Uh, I know we didn't do a very good job of that yesterday. I apologize. Somebody asked uh, where you can find Joel after 9 o'clock. You can find Joel at premarketprep.com. Uh, there is a paywall for that, just so you know. But it's premarketprep.com. Uh, there's a few things we didn't cover Uh uh, as always, uh, we didn't cover Coupa. They had earnings last night. Uh, that's kind of the way it goes. We can't cover everything. Uh, we didn't cover uh, Stitch Fix. They also had earnings last night in Marvell. Uh, Thor had earnings this morning. I kind of want to look at Thor, uh, only because this is a crazy reopening play. Right? THL. What's it doing this morning? Uh, don't Don't see a ton of volume. I'm Thor this morning. Let's get that banner off the screen. Uh, what were Thor's numbers? Go to the news feed here. THO, uh, EPS. Oh, my God, guys. They crushed it. Look at that. EPS of $3.29 for a $2.34 estimate. They beat the estimate by more than 50%. That's, that's bonkers. Sale of $3.46 for $3.01 billion. So they blew it away. Hardly a surprise, right? This is like reopening play 101. Anyway, I don't see uh only see any that much volume here. I don't know why my chart's being weird like that. Oh, there we go. Um, okay. Uh was there anything else in chat that uh yeah, you're right, you're right, OP. We did not cover the the El Salvador uh news in crypto. Uh though my biggest takeaway from that was why isn't Bitcoin up? If this news is so transformative, let's pull up a, let's pull up a um, you know, let's just zoom out. Let's pull up a daily chart on Bitcoin. If the news is so transformative, why isn't Bitcoin up? I don't know. I, I'm long Bitcoin. I own Bitcoin. That's my question. If the news is so good. Would, ex- would have expected to see Bitcoin rally, especially after they had this huge conference over the weekend. Um so that that would be my my question about that. Okay, uh, looking ahead, we have another big guest on the show tomorrow, same time, nine o'clock. Fred Teal will be on the show. If you don't know Fred Teal, he is from ba ba ba. Pull the chart up on the screen. Marathon, M A R A. Fred Teal will be on the show tomorrow, at nine o'clock, talking Mara. Uh, any questions? Email us if you, if you have a question for Fred or for Mara. Email us shows at pinsgun.com. I will do my best to uh, compile them and ask as many of them as I can. So uh, no, no relation to Peter. I I thought that too. That was actually the first thing that I googled. I googled is Fred Teal related to Peter? To, to whoa, that's weird. Is Fred Teal related to uh, Peter? And uh, no, it's not. Why did my chart just do that? That's really weird. Um, okay. Uh, looking ahead to today, we've got David Green coming on in about five minutes. Going to be live trading the open. Uh, if you've never seen that, I highly recommend it. He can trade anything and everything 
as long as it hits his levels. Uh, and it's a it, it's a very unique style of trading. Actually, it's not. I wouldn't even say it's like that unique in in principle. It's unique in in the indicators he uses, but in principle, it's really just like trading charts. Uh, he he goes until about eleven o'clock. So I recommend sticking around to watch David Green. We got Spac's attack. As always today, 11 to noon, another big guest for them. Uh, Julian Klamachko will be on the show. If you follow SPACs and you don't know Julian, um, you're doing it wrong. Uh, we got the Power Hour today at noon. We got uh, no get technical. Neil is attending a conference. So no get technical today. We got our crypto show at 2. We got Biotech Buzz at 2.30 at the At The Close show. Uh, Cannabis Insider. All, our whole schedule can be found on our Twitter account. If you go to Benzinga.com slash Twitter, or what did I say? Twitter.com slash Benzinga. I meant to say. And our schedule for the day should be pinned to the top. And I don't know why it is. So let's get that. I don't know where that graphic is. All right. I apologize. It's not up there now. But anyway, you can just stay tuned. Uh, and or you can just go to youtube.com slash benzinga and see our schedule for the day right there up via the streams that are coming up. Um oh here it is actually. Jeez. Pull it up for you right now. Here is our schedule for the day. Jeez Louise. Boom. That's the plan for the day. Crypto show at 2, Biotech Buzz, 2.30, At The Close Show, 3.30, Cannabis Insider, Ryan Rosbiani, and Trading Nomadic wrapping up the, the day. If you haven't already, please give us a like button. I'd greatly, greatly appreciate it. If you're not subscribed to Benzinga, please do so. I would appreciate that as well. How many likes are we at today? I mean, come on. We had a pretty good, that's a pretty good get, right? That's a pretty good get. Uh, the president of Xpon right there. So let me, let me see some likes. Are we at least at like 500? Oh, we're at 350? Oh, pains me. It pains me. Guys are killing me. Anyway, uh, AB, is David Green good to go? Just about? All right. David Green is just about good to go. Uh, so this stream is going to end. It'll redirect straight to David. So if your autoplay is turned on, you don't got to do anything. Uh, if your autoplay is not turned on, maybe just uh, cl click the play button or to click on the video when it when it rolls over. Um, but that's going to be a wrap for me. Please remember, as always, all the information from our show, from all of our shows, are meant to be used as informational purposes and not for investing or trading advice. The views expressed do not represent those of Benzinga. And I'm going to hop. It is 9.23. We got two minutes until David Green comes on. Five minutes until the opening. There you see AB behind me going to start the stream up with David Green. Uh, so two minutes with David Green, seven minutes till the open. Um, hope everyone has had a good morning so far. I hope uh, you have a good rest of your day. Uh, yeah, that's exactly it, OP. Gen Z is too lazy to hit the like button. That's the problem. That's the problem. Uh, yeah, and that Labu discussion with David was great. I totally agree. Um, thank you very much, OP, for that. Um, okay, that's a wrap for me. Pro.Benzinga.com, guys. Pro.Benzinga.com. You get a free two-week trial. No questions, no obligations, just free two weeks. Check it out. If you like it, you can get a discount with the code YouTube20. If you don't like it, then fine. It's not for you. It's not for everyone. Pro.Benzinga.com. I'm Spencer Israel. It's going to be a wrap. David Green coming up right now to trade the Open.